Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. <laughs> I'm the fella that lady said I look like a drunk. <laughs> well, I am an alcoholic. My name is John. Hi, John. And it's good to be here. It really is. I've been in the fellowship long enough so that I really appreciate listening to uh, our speakers this weekend. It seems to me that... Uh, that when I listen to speakers, they seem to put my life together. I see things that normally, I guess, I don't think about because I get kind of a busy doing things in everyday living. And I was thinking how how God moves in mysterious ways. And someone said once, a wonders the way he performs. And I was thinking how I would have never believed if... Uh, you know, when I lived in, in my reservation, uh, one year I, uh, I slept in this old empty house because I have just lost, uh, seven members in my family. They died with DV and my mother just died. And I, I was thinking how scared I was and how I have never told anyone for years because somehow I felt that nobody understands. <laughs> And I'm the last person in the world would ever believe that someday I, I would be here in Kansas City standing up in front of a couple of thousand people and realize that people understand. You know, I, I'm not the type of a person who have ever believed that I would be invited to speak in, in weekends like this. You know, I arrived here in AA. I was 28 years old. I was living in a mission in Syracuse, New York, and uh, I have been living in missions off and on for for those seven years because the fella uh, by the name of Tom who run the uh, rescue mission, if you attend one of his religious services, he would always allow you to sleep in a, a dormitory with other bums, and so I have attended many of Tom's religious services. And I was there one night when a man walked in. He got sober. He was one of the bums that I uh, that I have seen now and then. And he got sober in Salvation Army, and he came to see me, and, and he says to me, I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, good for you. You know, I, I have never met one before. I came here, he said, to ask you to come to an AA meeting with me. I said, no, because I have already had a bed. <laughs> he says to me, at this meeting, they have coffee and donuts, and they're free. So I said, why didn't you say so? I was 28 years old. I have never been married. Never. I couldn't read and write, so I never had a driving license, never owned a car. And I wasn't dressed too well, but I've been sober about three weeks. So I came here. And as I was walking through the doors of AA, a man stood there. He was a man who was shaking hands to people who were coming to a meeting. I didn't know it then, but later I find out that he was a lawyer. It's over 13 years. And he grabbed my hand and he said that he was glad to see me. And I don't remember being glad to see him at all. <laughs> but I remember my first speaker. My first speaker was a lady judge. And she says, if you are new, try to identify. And I said to myself, as soon as I get my donuts. <laughs> I'm getting the hell out of here. And she talked about her 
father being a judge. Her husband is a director in a general hospital who is a doctor in Syracuse. And here I am, I sitting there, being skits for 70 years. I suffered from wine sores. I needed to be sober about six weeks so that my face would clear up. I'm living in a mission. I'm supposed to pay uh, 35 cents a night, and I'm behind three weeks' rent. <laughs> you know, I have financial problems. <laughs> and, and when I talk about God moving in mysterious ways, uh, there was a man. Of course, you know, you look back 32 years later, and if you are as active as I am, and I have, I have been going to the recovery program, the step meetings, for the past uh, 27 years, twice a week. And what we do in our area, and it was good for me, when I first arrived there 27 years ago, when I walked into my first step meeting, what they did was to read the first uh, seven or eight pages of the step, and then you had about 12 people around the table who start to uh, share or express their ideas, their insights, th their beliefs as to what this particular step means to them. And at first it didn't make sense to me, but I've been doing it for 27 years. And you know, and unless you're really stupid, I mean, you have to learn something, <laughs> you know. So I, I have learned something about things that AA talks about, things that speakers talks about. I even learned what the lady judge meant when he used to say, it's a mental obsession that precedes the first drink, and once you take a drink, now it's covered with a physical compulsion. <laughs> <laughs> I used to say, holy Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so today I look back, with an entirely a new vision because I have been taught to be able to see things that once I could not see. To be able to understand a lot of things that once I, I could not understand. You know, people in AA will tell you when you have a problem, this one you have to let go. Call your sponsor and talk to him. You know, pray. You know, after all those years... Uh, you know, you put your life together and you feel good about it. And you know, it, something has to change for a person like me to stand up in front of uh, a couple of thousand people and to say that I am very glad to be here. And I am. But it also is a very uh, healthy feeling to look back today and to realize that I have been a very lucky human being. And that God has put some very special people in my life. I call them special because when I arrived here, not only that I didn't know how sick I was, but I could not see myself with a lady judge. When I heard the word judge, I said, I don't belong here. Because I have met a judge before. And he told me that the Fayette Park in Syracuse was for the decent people. And I believed him. He used to call me John. <laughs> because I've been there so many times, you know. <laughs> so I was leaving that night, and this lawyer, he must have known that I couldn't see myself with the lady judge. He probably knew that I was very sick, and he certainly knew I needed help because he put his arms around me. And he says to me, before you leave, I want you to meet some of my friends. And I met people in AA for the first time. Now, we are told that, uh, that we have to be ready, and I'm sure I was, because I was touched. I was touched the way people accepted me the way they wanted me to come back, the friendly, the friends that, you know, they expressed their feelings. And it brought me back, and as you know, this was, of course, important for me because I needed to come back. I needed to come back because uh, 
uh, I needed to stop drinking because without stop drinking, uh, I cannot survive. And I didn't know how. And I came back and, of course, uh, I, I met my sponsor, Pat. Now, I knew Pat. I, I never liked Pat. Uh, I'm, I, Pat was a bum with a degree and there is nothing worse than a bum with a degree and uh, Pat knew everything drunk or sober and, and, and I never liked him he used to say John uh, he comes to me and he said John I'm your sponsor this is my second night at the meeting he says I have a car outside I will bring you home then he would bring me to a mission and he would pick me up, but he was always late. He never was on time. And of course, I didn't know that I was perfectionist. <laughs> you know, if you see me laying with a sidewalk with long hair, fine sores and dirty, you wouldn't stop and say, now this man, he's a perfectionist. <laughs> So I had troubles from the very first time I arrived here. <laughs> but the man who, who opened uh, my mind a little bit was a fellow by the name of Harry J., who was a secretary in Central Group. Harry would invite me to his home some Sundays, his wife Helen, and he had two daughters, and I would have a dinner at his home, and he would bring me back to a mission in the afternoon. One day, Harry spoke, and, and he talked about things that we talk about a lot in AA, like fears. That I talk about fears because fear has been perhaps one of my biggest problems all my life, and fear cripples me. I cannot move when I have fear. Harry talked about being lonely. I know what loneliness is. I identified with Father Martin when he said, there's one thing that alcohol teaches to all his victims, and yeah, is how to be lonely. And I know the feeling of not belonging in life, but I always thought it was because I was an Indian. Well, Ari talked about those things, and well, uh, to some extent, it was a little confusing because I, I guess I would have never believed that man who has a nice home, and a wife, and and two daughters and an officer in a bank would feel the way I do, and I'm sleeping on the floor in a mission, and I have never been married, and I couldn't read and write, and, and I don't have a job, and I don't have a family. Uh, so I didn't understand why Ari and I felt the same way until much later in my sobriety when I started to learn how to live sober. But I guess what, what, what I have received from listening to Ari uh, that this business of uh, that we speakers talk about that I, I am not alone and there is one thing about alcoholism uh, the way it affected me was I was always alone and I've always tried to figure out why is it that I'm so alone when I'm so but you know unlike the lady speaker last night she said that she was happy long time before she took a drink. There's a lot of speakers in AA who are happy before they took a drink. Uh, I wasn't. And I'm not from a, 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 a dysfunctional home. <laughs> 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 I tell the kids that the only reason you come from a dysfunctional home is because you're in it. <laughs> <laughs> But I come from a, a trouble home. Uh, my father, my sister comes to my home in the summertime. I have a sister. And she visited me this summer. And she had 13 kids and they're all grown up. And uh, she says to me that, that we were well off. And I was surprised when I was a kid. She said we were very well off. Because my father, my father made moccasins for this lumber company by the dozens. And he would make axe sandals and snowshoes. And he would trade everything. And my sister said that we had one room full of food. And my, my idea, 
my sister's idea of wealth is to have one room loaded with food. <laughs> and, and thank God she still believes that today. <laughs> but my father also sang in a small church in a reservation, and Sunday morning he would stand there and hold a railing in one hand, book on one hand, never open his eyes, and he would sing, and he would sweat. And I used to be afraid that one day he would let the railing go. But he died, and of course, then my family took sick. And in in very short time, about five or six years, were wiped out with TV. And when I was 13, my mother was dying, and that's when I developed fears because I, I felt that people looked at me and treated me like if I had TV. And of course, when I say that one day you look back with a new vision, I realize today nobody treated me like that. There's a lot of problems with me that, that I, I, that I had because the way I would, the way I wanted to see things and the way I felt inside, you know. My people worked in lumber camps in Maine, so when I was 14, I left home. I went to the state of Maine. I arrived in a place called Patton, Maine, and uh, there was an office in the street, and I walked in there. I wanted a job working in lumber camp, but the fellow said that I was too young. But he said there was a, a CC camp about 20 miles in the woods, and he needed a dishwasher because the Second World War has taken more, most of younger people. And he said, if you wish to walk that far, it's up to you. So I, I walked and I arrived in the camp and, and I met a fella by the name of Bill Langster who was in charge and I stayed with him for four years. When I was 18, uh, I left the lumber camp to join the Canadian infantry because the the family of this man told me that I would be better off if I should join the younger people. And my idea was to join the army in Canada so when I get my pass, I could go home and show my people now that I have grown. I didn't join because I'm a patriotic type of a person. <laughs> you know, sick as I was then, I knew that this country was ours before it was yours. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, I was hoping maybe I can win a medal without getting hurt because <laughs> I'm a very sensitive person and I get hurt easily and I don't suffer well. <laughs> what I didn't know was that uh, if you don't have an education, the Canadian Army don't allow you to go on training. So they gave me a job washing dishes. Now, it's funny, I loved washing dishes until I was asked to do it in the Canadian Army. Because now things were telling me something that I couldn't deal with. Like, uh, if you wash dishes in Canadian Army, you're not as good as the next person. That's the way I took things. See, it was in my recovery when the book told me that the man who doesn't have faith, it, it, it is a man who will seek approval. A person who don't believe in himself, who don't like himself, will tell lies about himself in order to fit in in life. You know? And I know, I know what it means because that's exactly what I did. If I go out with someone, I told lies because I was so ashamed that I was washing dishes and it became something like an obsession to me. And, uh, and because of that, uh, I hated the army. And I, I didn't drink. I met uh, a fella who was from Ontario that I chum around with him. Uh, neither one of us drank. Uh, I didn't smoke. And, and I don't know why. I just didn't want to. And, uh, we chum around together and we, we know, we used to talk about doing great things one day. We never did anything, but we we're going to do a lot of great things one day. And, People who don't have anything always talk about doing great things one day. And, and uh, someone once told us that in St. Lawrence Street in Montreal, if you have money, you can go over there and pick the girls right in the street. 
I mean, they don't even have to like you. <laughs> you don't have to worry about rejection. <laughs> so we talk about that for six months. <laughs> one day we'll do that. <laughs> then one day we went. We got all dressed up just in case they didn't like us. We arrive over there and there they were. About seven or eight of them right in the streets. So we stood there. And we stood there. <laughs> and we stood there longer than most girls did. <laughs> I didn't know I needed a drink. I felt what people would say if I do such a thing. Then we got our discharge. I was 21 years old. He says to me, John, what do you say we get dressed up and... We'll go to a nightclub and we'll have a few drinks. So we each bought a suit. We got dressed up. And we, we went to a place called a Blurry Cafe in Montreal in the second floor. As you walk in there, there's a, a four-piece orchestra playing. And right in front, there's a girl singing, practically with no clothes on. And I guess that's where I received my first spiritual awakening. <laughs> and then I took a drink. Now, I've been listening to people like me for 32 years, and, and uh, it happened the same thing to me that happened to all of us when I drank. Although I, I don't believe that I was uh, a person who was really in trouble. I guess I've always didn't really like uh, being an Indian. There's something about it that I was uncomfortable with. I was very sensitive about it. There were times I would tell lies about it because I knew I can get away with it. <laughs> when the early days when I drank in New York States, if they find out you're an Indian, they wouldn't serve you. They believed there was once a wise man who said, never give an Indian a, a fire water, he goes crazy. <laughs> that bastard never seen an Irish drunk, or you would never make <laughs> And, of course, I was sensitive because I didn't talk with English. I was sensitive that, that I had no education. And I really never fit in in life, you know. And so when I took a drink, it, it, it wiped everything out the way I felt. Now, I don't know, I don't know whether uh, it is for that reason why I became an alcoholic. I don't know why I get into it. I really believe what the lady judge said, that alcoholism is an obsession in mind and a very physical abnormal reaction to a body. Once I take a drink, something happens to me that doesn't happen to a social drinker, not because social drinker is better than I am. I mean, I've been around long enough in this world, and I met a lot of sick people. And some of them poor bastards don't even know enough to drink. You know? <laughs> and when they drink, they're social drinkers. I mean, they make me nervous. I don't know why I am like that. I know that I like the idea of turning right around and grab somebody's hand and feel good about it. And I have never felt that way. I like to be able to ask a girl for a dance, and I couldn't do that because I, there's something about me that that stops me. You know, and I like, uh, well, every once in a while when I drank, I have that feeling that I could lick anybody. I know today is a very dangerous feeling. <laughs> you know? Because when I feel that way, I, I would go to a place called Smitty's in Syracuse, New York, now, Smitty's, it's where all the New York Indians drink. I'm a Mi'kmaq Indian. I don't drink in Smitty's because we don't communicate too well. <laughs> and every once in a while, I, I go to, go to Smitty's when I feel like I could lick anyone. <laughs> I would go over there and I stand there and I would drink and I'd pick someone, some Indian, who looks like uh, I don't like. <laughs> and I would stare at him. 
until he gets the message. And if he doesn't respond, I'll go over and I'll tap him on his shoulder and I'll tell him, you know, you look like somebody I don't like. <laughs> and I would hit him. And then they would call the cops and I would wait. And not because I- I'm not an hateful person. You know, I- honestly, I don't, I don't think that I have ever felt that I would like to kill anyone. You know, but I, I've always wanted to put a cop down. You know, but they come three of them at a time. But I would give them. A, I would. I let. They would earn their pay, uh, and uh, I never was quite successful to satisfy me. But anyway, one time they sent this big cop. He was a big fat cop, and I thought he was all alone. I'll take care of him. And I start wrestling with him, and I got a good hold on his pants, and I pull. But he was so fat that his pants came first. <laughs> and he arrested me. And next morning, I'm in court, and Judge Dorsey, I didn't know he was an alky. This guy brought his pants with him. He holds them up in the court. Judge said, John. <laughs> it's a very touchy, you know. He called me by my first name. <laughs> what happened? I said, nothing. All I want to do is put him down, but he's so fat. When I said that, Judge started to laugh. <laughs> and people in the courtroom were laughing. So I laughed too. <laughs> they were all still laughing when I got my three months in Jimmyville. <laughs> but believe it or not, that's when I was social drinking. <laughs> that's when alcohol was fun. Another thing I like is... Uh, Falling in love a couple of times a month. (laughs) About 11 o'clock at night. I'm looking at her with one eye because I no longer can see her with two eyes. (laughs) But I'm telling her how beautiful she is. What I didn't know that alcohol affected my vision. (laughs) The next morning I look at her. I said, holy Christ. (laughs) You were so cute last night. You know, I couldn't wait to get drunk all over again so I can fall asleep. (laughs) And Bill Wilson said, it's cunning and baffling and powerful. (laughs) It sure is. (laughs) And I think we all know what happens is that Alcohol doesn't do anymore what it used to. And that's what happened to me. The bums used to say to me, John, you look sick, why don't you take a place? And you know, when a bum tells you you look sick, you're sick. (laughs) And in my days, there were no treatment centers, so I went to see a priest because that's what the bums did, to go and see a priest and take a place. And I would go and see a priest and... And being uh, uh, supposed to be a Catholic, and which is something I have not as yet learned, uh, you would want me to go to confession. But the message was, as I understood, that I should try to live a decent life. And I knew that it was good to live a decent life. I mean, I knew how to be decent. My, my mother, when I lived in a reservation, she used to say, John, you don't swear because it's bad. But I never swear because I never had an obsession of swearing. Just like I don't have an obsession of drinking orange drink. Uh, 27 years ago, I was in Paul's restaurant and I drank orange and I had upset stomach. I have not drank orange since then. (laughs) And I don't miss it. And uh, I'm not the type of person, when I stop swearing, I don't miss it. So I don't swear. My mother used to say, you don't tell lies and, and, and you don't criticize people because it's not honorable. I understand what it means. I really do. A person who criticizes other people and persons who tell lies uh, is a person who removes honor from himself. I know that. But the thing was, when I tried to be good, not only it's painful, but nothing happened. I find myself walking in streets with the same feelings I've always had 
I'm totally alone in this world. I mean, I am alone. And I try to figure out why I am alone. Well, it's because I'm an Indian. You know? If only, if only I, I have an education, maybe I would have a good job, maybe I would have a car. If only I had my four teeth front, uh, uh, wasn't missing, <laughs> maybe I would have a nice girl. Maybe this, maybe that, and I go and get drunk because I know that alcohol will remove his feelings, or maybe even worse, I didn't know that I was, I became a slave to alcohol, uh, like other people who have a good job and who have a wife and, and who have a degree and who have money and, and, and who have friends. Uh, we go to drink for the same reason. Go to drink for the same reason. Sure, it's cunning. Sure, it's baffling. Sure, it's powerful. I have become a slave to alcohol, and I didn't know it. And people around me were good people, like Tom. Tom believed in his God. You know, but Tom didn't understand that my problem is not because I was bad. My problem was because I was sick. And Tom would say to me, John, there's a fellow by the name of Billy Graham coming to the war memorial. You go and listen to him. This man helps a lot of people, and he will help you. So I go to listen to Billy Graham, and I got sober, but he left. <laughs> and I got drunk, and I felt if Billy Graham didn't leave, I wouldn't have get drunk. Of course I would get drunk. If Billy Graham stayed thousand years, I would get drunk. Do you know what I mean? I remember I was in a mission one night, and then a fellow get up, and he said that for many years he was a bum just like us. There was about 75 of us sitting there. He says to us, one night in this mission, he said, I accepted Christ as my personal Savior. Since then, he said, I have never drank. Uh, uh, I, I got married. I have a home. I work nights, and I just bought a brand new station wagon. And then he says, any of you bums can do the same thing. All you have to do is move forward. So I move forward. I knew nothing about Christ. I'd been listening to those lumberjacks for four years talking about him. <laughs> and, 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 you know, by the time they finished with him, you wouldn't believe him either. <laughs> but I've always wanted a new station wagon. And, and, but I moved forward, and this guy kneeled down next to me. He said I was saved. Well, I was facing a judge next morning. And I don't know about you, but I have never felt safe with Judge Dorsey. That's when he told me that the Fayette Park in this city was for the decent people. You see? And I believed it. And, it, it, you know, one of the most amazing things when I arrived here, uh, I was treated not like if I wasn't decent. I was treated like if I was. You know? And I came back here because... When I felt I was accepted, when I felt wanted, when I felt that people cared, uh, I felt comfortable. I came back not because I knew that I was an alcoholic. I came back because no place in this world, even in my own reservation, felt that I was accepted. You know? And that's why many times I say, if there is God, it certainly works through people. And if he has any language at all, it certainly comes from us. You know, because I came back and I met my sponsor. My sponsor used to bring me a sandwich, you know, and, and he used to say, you can only eat half of it. It meant nothing to me. It meant absolutely nothing to me. Uh, it was 10, 12 years later when I, when I understood that my sponsor stopped the car, bought a sandwich, and bring it to a bum in the mission, and I suddenly realized that anyone who stops the car buys a sandwich to bum who lives in the mission, he does it because he either cares or believes in something. You know? And then you said to me, John, you can't stay sober and live with those bums. But I felt comfortable with bums. I've been with them for seven years. But God must have been on his side because one night mission burned down. <laughs> and, 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 
3 o'clock in the morning, I'm knocking at the door. I said, Pat, mission burned down. He said, that's the grace of God. <laughs> and next day, he brought me to 12 Step House. I worked there for almost a year. My job was to wash floors and wax floors, make coffee, answer the telephone, and wash dishes. And uh, I did all right, but I, I, I got thrown out of there because uh, some there were people who played cards all night. And some lady called one night. She was drunk. But see, in those days, when someone calls, you help them. They, to those of you who've been around 25, 30 years, there were no treatment centers. You bring drunks home. That's what we did. You bring drunks home. You don't leave them out there. You bring them home and sober them up, you know. And this lady called. She was drunk. So I said to these guys that someone needs help. And when they find out who she was, they said she's been around for years. And that's all she does is use people in AA. Well, I knew I was, they were wrong. But problem with me, I don't know what to do when I'm right. <laughs> so I did what I always do. I upset the table, and I punched this guy right in the mouth. I never liked the bastard anyway. He had a big mouth. <laughs> but they throw me out, and, and I'm walking down Fayette Street, and my sponsor picked me up. And next morning, he brought me to Salvation Army. And in my 50 years of sobriety, I was having all kinds of problems. I was in Salvation Army, working for $16 a week. I have a. I could come home at 11 o'clock, and I was having problems because I was getting bored in AA meetings. I was bored. I felt that I, that there was something missing in my life. I felt lonely. So I decided to leave. I just walked away from Salvation Army. And one o'clock in the morning, I arrived in Marlboro, Mass., a town that I have never been. I was broke. And in Main Street, there is a flop house, a hotel, they call it. And I went in there, and I slept in the men's room. And that's where I was in my fifth year sobriety. And when you sleep in a men's room in Strange Town, you don't lay there and say, My God, isn't that nice to be sober? <laughs> mm -hmm. That I'm so happy. <laughs> God is so good. You know what I mean? He is. He is, really. You know. But what happened to me, I went to, to a meeting next night, and I met Paul. Paul says to me, John, they're starting a new group in Worcester Monday night. Would you like to go? I said, sure, because I've always loved it. I walked into my first step meeting, and that's what they did. They read the first seven, eight pages, and they would start talking about it, and I'm sitting there, lost. I didn't understand what they were saying. It meant absolutely nothing to me. And I said to myself, I don't like these meetings, and I wouldn't go back. Month later, Paul would say to me, John, would you like to go to a meeting in Worcester? And I would say, yes. But what happened was, I met Father Fred. Father Fred, who is now 80 years old, sober 28 years, and he was going to institutional meeting. This is 27 years ago. And he says to me, John, uh, I go to institution meetings, and I want someone to come with me. Would you like to come? I said, sure. But I told him not to ask me to speak because I don't talk good English, and I have no education. And he said, don't worry about it. And I thought that meant no. <laughs> and, 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 and so we travel around, and we go all kinds of institutions. Uh, Saturday at 2 o'clock, we used to go to Walpole Prison. This is a maximum prison where people kill other people and rape and all that stuff. And Father Fred used to stand there and he used to uh, talk to these prisoners. And one day he says to them, I brought a speaker with me. Well, I knew there was nobody there. <laughs> I looked around anyway. Now, what do you say to prisoners? I mean, I never even considered killing anyone. You couldn't very well stand up and tell them how you tear a cop's pants off. <laughs> I mean, these people kill people and they have pride. <laughs> yeah. But I did like what we all do when somebody asks us to speak. We all get, because it's not our job to speak. 
We all get nervous. We all feel scared inside. We all feel insecure. You know, if you know it two days before, you, you, you study your talk all night and you get up and you forget what the hell you studied for. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very upset. I said to Father Fred, you were supposed to ask me to speak. Well, he said, I tell lies. <laughs> but what happened is that we would sit in the parking lot after uh, in Holy Cross, that's where he was, and he would talk to me about the recovery program. Because, you know, uh, you know, uh, we were over the meeting one night, and, and he talks about being restored to sanity. And, of course, because I never understood what it meant, it, it offended me, because I'm a very sensitive person. And I get hurt easily, and I don't suffer well. So I said to Father Fred, what do you think about this business of being restored? <laughs> the sanity. Well, he says, you don't understand. The step says, come to believe. I said, that don't work for me. I'd already done that. Then he said, what did you do? Then I told him about going to confession, listening to Billy Graham, accepting Christ as my personal Savior. And every time I'd done that, I wound up facing a judge. You know, I'm sick, not stupid. You know? <laughs> So I don't get mixed up with this God business, you know. Well, he says, John, he says, all you need, he tells you in the big book, he says, and it's true. All you need to learn how to believe is to have an open mind. You see, open mind, he says, is when you're allowed to become teachable. When you're allowed to become teachable, you learn to see things that before you could not see. You know? Like, uh, my problem is, it's not because I'm an Indian. That's true. My problem has never been because I'm an Indian. That's not why I felt the way I felt. You know why Ari and I feel the same way. Ari is an officer in the bank. Ari has a wife, Helen. She's a beautiful person. He has two daughters. He had a couple of cars. Ari and I, not... When we lay down at night, we, ha we feel the same way. Why? Because we think and we live the same way. And the book says, the first step, an alcoholic. An alcoholic, he says, will not be willing to clear the wreckage of his own past. He will not be willing to admit anything. He will not be willing to make any restitutions unless he does it to save his own skin. I said, that's not true. I am not like that. I'm really a nice person. <laughs> you don't understand. I had problems in life. I had problems. But you know, I stand up here 32 years later, more matured person, and I'm here to tell you it's exactly the truth. My problem has always been not because the way I was brought up, truly, my problem is that I have never was able to accept the truth. And you know why? Because I couldn't do it alone. I could never accept the truth. Whether I was in washing dishes in Kenyan army or anything else. Father Fred said to me, you know, not going back to that meeting because people say things that you don't like. That's not being teachable. You're running away from being teachable. Then he said something that night that changed a lot of things in my life, maybe because I was in the program long enough to be able to understand. He says to me, John, you and I, each day we go from where we are with what we have. It really doesn't matter, he says, whether you can read and write. It doesn't matter whether you have a job. It doesn't matter, he says, whether you have money. Every day, he says, we go from where we are with what we have. Then on my way home that night, I used to take a bus 16 miles. I was 33 years old, sober five years on my bus. On that bus, I said to myself, John, you know, you're 33 years old and you have absolutely nothing. You know, I can't get up in a meeting and talk about what's program is doing for me because I had nothing to talk about. You know? I said, 
you have no education, you don't have a job, you don't have a girl, you don't have a home. But Father Fred says, every day we start from where we are with what we have. And you know what I said? I'm going to start here. And you know, he changed my life because when I left Friday, I left the 14-room house. Last week, I went out and I spent $23,000 to buy a car. You know, I live like a white man, dollar down. And, and, uh, <laughs> so next morning, I went to see Paul like I always did. Paul says to me, Rita, who was the waitress, she wanted to know if you could paint her house. She wants an estimate. Go over there and give her an estimate. So I went over there and I walked around three times. I went in there and I said, Rita, it'll cost you $300. She gave me a job right away because other contractors wanted twelve and $1,400. <laughs> and just because you're trying, it doesn't mean you make sense. You know? I said to Paul, I got a job, but I don't, I'm broke. We said, go back and ask Rita. Maybe she'll give you some money. And she gave me $100. And I said to myself, I think I'll buy a white coveralls if I'm going to be a president in my own company. I should buy a white coveralls. And I, I bought some paint. I went to a meeting. And a fellow came to see me that meeting that night. He said, John, I'm told you're looking for a ladder. <laughs> I said, I am. He said, I work for a telephone company. I will deliver you a ladder Monday morning, but don't tell anyone it's against the rules. The damn thing is yellow. You know, you can see it miles away. <laughs> But he was new, and he was sick as I was. And, uh... <laughs> but I finished painting this house, and I owed Paul like $65. And I, I met a guy in AA who was a plumber. He says to me, John, I'm told you're painting houses. I said, yeah. He said, I have a house about seven miles from here. It's a ranch house. All you need is a stepladder. So I borrowed a stepladder, and I stood in the corner with my white coveralls and my drop cloths, and, and I stopped the bus. And this guy, he looks at me, and he looks at my ladder. He says, you can't be serious. I said, I am. I'm self-employed. You know, he looks at me, and he says, uh, if I give you a ride, would you promise you'll never do it again? <laughs> my next house was a school teacher. She taught school for 40 years, and she retired. Paul says to me, John, is 69 questions. Why don't you ask her? And so one day I said to her, you know, I, I have never gone to school. And I want to have my driving license. I want to know about, I want to memorize the 69 questions. Could you help me? She said, I have taught thousands of people. And when I'm talking about learning to become teachable, humming a lot, humble enough to listen and to learn from your fellow man. You see... And this is what I'm trying to do. And a couple of weeks later, she taught me to learn these questions inside out. Even I knew I was going to pass. I don't know if it was a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months. Anyway, when I went to take the test, I knew I was going to pass. This guy, he sits down, and he asked me a couple of questions. I mean, I was depressed. I said, what the hell she used to have all this education? Nobody gives a damn. <laughs> I worked a long time for a lousy couple of answers. <laughs> but I did get my license. And Paul, who owned restaurant, he came to see me with this big black station wagon. I used to call it 11 passengers because I used to bring 11 people to a meeting. He said, John, for $750, it's yours. And I had no money. But the lady who belonged to the Saturday night group, she says to me, John, if you can get $250, that was the down payment, I will co-sign for you. So I borrowed the money the next day where I was working. She co-signed for me, and here I was in my 50-year sobriety, president in my own company, and I had a driving license and 11 passenger station wagon. <laughs> and, and so, so I decided maybe I should find me a girlfriend. But I had these four teeth missing. I lost those while I was communicating with those New York Indians. And <laughs> but someone said there was a new dentist in AA. And I have learned by this time that new people are very anxious to help you. 
<laughs> so I caught him one night, and I, I said to him, you know, I have a problem. He said, what's the problem? I said, I'm looking for a girlfriend, but I have these four teeth missing. So he gave me his card, and a couple of months later, he gave me a new set of teeth. Then I met a lady at the meeting. She said, John, I'm told that you have a car. I said, 11 passengers. <laughs> and uh, She said, I, I run a home of an alcoholic woman. Uh, I have nine girls. I'm looking for someone to bring these girls to a meeting. Would you like the job? I said, I'll be very happy to. <laughs> and that's where I met my wife, Kathy. On our way home that night from the meeting, I said to Kathy, would you like to go out on a date? She said, no. <laughs> I mean, she didn't even think. <laughs> and I'm a very sensitive person. <laughs> I get hurt easily, and I don't suffer well. <laughs> and I was hurt. And on my way home, I said to myself, who in the hell she thinks she is? <laughs> here she is living with all those women. None of them have anything. And here I am. I'm president in my own company. <laughs> I drive 11 passenger station wagon. And I have new set of teeth. <laughs> Who the hell wants her anyway? Thursday night came, and I picked the girls again, and on our way back from the meeting, I said to her, would you like to come to show in Boston Sunday? And she said, yes. We went to show in Boston, and on our way back, I asked her to marry me. <laughs> she says, I don't even know you. I said, we still have a few miles to go. We'll get acquainted. <laughs> And that's 27 years ago. <laughs> Three months later, we got married, and uh, we only had $85. Nobody was at the wedding. We rent a, a three-room three apartment that was empty for $13 a week. And Kathy and I walked in there with the coffee table that was given to us from this man who run the fate house, once was a furniture maker. So we had a coffee table, but it was a coffee table, and even newlyweds cannot sleep in coffee tables. So. <laughs> so my wife and I slept on the floor. But I have been around long enough to know that you can have fun on the floor. <laughs> uh, you know, I I'm sick, not stupid. Uh, and, uh, uh, I spoke one time, and I mentioned that, and some lady, after the meeting, she came to me, and she's called me young man. She said, young man, I don't know how much fun, she said, you can have on the floor. But I know, she said, you can have a lot of fun in the oriental rug. <laughs> I said, thank God you identify. <laughs> While Kathy and I were laying on the floor, I said to her, you know, I'm the only one left in the family. And, of course, uh, I, I would like to have a boy. And if you give me a boy, uh, I'll buy you a diamond. And you got to be sick, you know, you're laying on a floor and promising a diamond. <laughs> but the beautiful thing was that Kathy was sick enough, so she believed me. <laughs> and Christmas came along, and she was in the hospital. And I walked into a bank. First time in my life, I wanted to borrow a $200. The fella asked me if I had flattery. I didn't know what in the hell it was. I'd been coming to these meetings, you know, six years, and nobody ever talks about flattery. <laughs> did you ever, did you ever hear a conference speaker talks about flattery? <laughs> I always talk about flattery. <laughs> I went to three banks, and they wanted clatter. I said, I will go and see Paul. He has a degree. He'll know something about clatter. <laughs> I walked in there, and I said, Paul, what's clatter? Well, he says, you got nothing to worry about. I said, why? He says, you don't have any. <laughs> I 
I said, what can I do? He says, you can pray. I said, Christ, Paul, you don't need God, they need collateral, you know? <laughs> so I went to next town called Hudson, Mass., and I walked into a bank, and there was a guy there, older guy, retiring, and I told him the story about Kathy and I. Well, he said, we don't usually lend money with sad stories. <laughs> now, when he said usually, I meant yes, you know. And then he says, how much do you want it anyway? And he sounded so good, I said, $400. <laughs> and I walked out of there with $400, and I walked into Allen Jewelry Store. I said to him, show me the best diamond that you have, and he did. I said, show me the cheapest one. <laughs> Show me one for $150, and he says, I said, I'll take it. He says, you want to charge it, of course, and I said, of course, <laughs> and, 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 and I brought it to my wife, and she calls me up early in the morning crying. She said, honey, it's a girl. Oh. I said, you got to be kidding. She said, no. <laughs> Christmas came again. She was in the hospital. She said, honey, it's a girl. I said, don't worry about it. Just have an open mind. That's what Father Fred said. A Christmas came along. She was in there again. She calls me up. She said, honey, it's twin boys. So you know what I always said, that God will give you what you want if you're willing to work hard for it. <laughs> Don't give up. <laughs> anyway, two years later, a girl came along, and two years later, a boy came along, and this is my story in AA. It is an AA story. And it is a story of, uh, of what AA can do for, for all of us, I suppose. It is, uh, it is a story of, about an Indian who arrived one night, who was lost, who did not understand, who was confused, didn't know he was sick. And, uh, and, and, and I met, of all people, Last person in the world would I have ever believed put his arms around me who was a lawyer. I understand why now because, you know, in recovery, in recovery, you, you're taught to understand a lot of things that once you couldn't. In, in our 11th step, there is a prayer of St. Francis, and St. Francis talks about, Lord, I pray that I may understand rather than to be understood. That I may console rather than to be consoled. He talks about, Lord, I pray that I may love rather than to seek love. I, he talks about, for it is in self forgetting that you find and giving that you receive. I know that God gave me uh, a right to be able to choose. And I know that in my own limited way, uh, I can learn to understand. Even in a limited way, I can learn to understand. But I have to choose. It is not a God's gift for me to understand. It is my gift to God. I have a free will to choose. I can understand. I can try to accept. Sure, it's painful. It's painful sometimes just to keep my mouth shut and not start in trouble at home. Sure, it's painful, but book says pain is a touchstone to a spiritual progress. You cannot grow unless you're willing to face pain. This is why I drank. I could not face anything uncomfortable. But if you tell me, John, John, you can stop smoking, but it's going to be very painful, John. You're going to feel like crawling in the wall. And you know it's true? I stopped smoking. And I felt like crawling. <laughs> I felt like hitting the first one I meet. How dare you look like somebody I don't like. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> so we learn. But more important, it is a story uh, of a person who arrived here one night with nothing. 
the fact that I have been asked to come here to speak, it is something that I do not understand. It is not something that it was my plan in life. You know? But it, for the longest time, I felt uncomfortable with it. And for the longest time, uh, I, I would 12 steps only a bums. Only a bum that I felt comfortable with to sit down and tell him a few things that I know about his life. <laughs> But I have brought uh, three people with me from, from my group. One of the guys I sponsor is a scientist. And, and you think you have a trouble 12 stepping a bum. <laughs> this guy thinks. <laughs> I mean, he thinks. Can you imagine when I arrived here and someone told you, you know, John, one day you'll sponsor a scientist? <laughs> the other one is a minister. <laughs> I really don't understand too much. Uh, really about how AA works. I think the speakers mentioned that. I really don't. In closing, I think that uh, I think some freedom from who you are comes by learning to accept the truth of who you are. And uh, I think that uh, being restored to sanity, Bill identifies it as soundness of mind. I think soundness of mind is when you, when you are able to, to, uh, to see the truth in life. I think that I am a person who never was able to see the truth. I looked at something and I see what I needed to see because I needed it to make excuse. I needed to use it to tell lies and I needed to do what our co-founder says through the years I have developed. Layers and layers and layers of self-justification. Dave says today, I didn't even know what the truth was. The worst of it is, I didn't give a damn. Because spiritually, I was bankrupt. I didn't give a damn. It meant nothing anymore whether I tell the truth and whether I tell lies. But why is it it has to mean something? It has to mean something because if you're going to walk one day if you want to walk with faith one day, you have to walk on what you believe in. You have to learn what is it that you believe in. You know? Am I so damn cheap that I'm going to walk around looking for approval and become a slave for what you think about me? Or isn't it God gave me something to say, this is what I believe. I stand here because I believe this, Okay? I couldn't say that. I couldn't say it because it was painful. It was painful. And I didn't know that I have to grow with pain. In, in closing, thank God that everything I have done and learned, it came from people. There was always someone would put me on the side and explain something to me. Truly, God has put some very special people in my life. I am very grateful to be here tonight, and thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.